Protesters are gathering in Myanmar once again, fighting for democracy after a night of deadly violence. Two people in Yangon were killed overnight when security forces opened fire on a group of protesters. The violence is escalating and we are seeing more of it on camera. This footage was taken by a protester showing the chaos in the streets as crowds of people clash with police. In a separate video posted on social media, police are seen dragging people from their houses and beating them in the street. Now, protesters in Myanmar know that they are risking their lives when they march against the military. One woman whose husband was killed by police told Reuters he believed the fight for democracy was worth dying for. It's young people who have the most to lose, of course, and they're the ones taking up the charge. Ivan Watson tells us about the protester whose death has galvanised the pro-democracy movement. She called herself Angel. Only 19 years old, Angel, real name Ma Kiel Zin, was a small but fierce presence at protests against the military coup that swept Myanmar's elected government from power on February 1st. She challenged the security forces. But Angel's defiance came to a sudden end when she was shot dead during a protest in the city of Mandalay on March 3rd. The young woman in the Everything Will Be OK t-shirt became a symbol of Myanmar's deadly fight for democracy. Before the coup, Angel behaved like many other teenagers, making TikTok videos. She liked to live freely. She was a good-hearted girl. Angel's friend, Min Tet Ng, hides his face for safety. You can see him here ducking for cover at her side. She was ready to risk her life way before that day. Several days earlier, Angel posted this message on Facebook, offering to donate her blood and organs to anyone who might need them. Using activist videos and eyewitness accounts, CNN reconstructed Angel's final moments around noon on March 3rd as demonstrators faced off against security forces. Angel cheered on the protesters, chanting, We won't run. Around 12.30, activist videos show Angel and the other protesters retreating amid the sound of gunshots. This was the moment activists say she was hit. They raced her on a motorcycle to a makeshift clinic where this doctor, who doesn't want to be identified, pronounced her dead on arrival. The primary cause of death was a brain injury caused by a gunshot wound. The doctor gave us the x-ray showing the bullet that killed Angel. Scores of people attended her funeral. But only hours later, Myanmar police dug up Angel's body to conduct an autopsy, they said. The next morning, bystanders found shovels, a bloody glove and razors, which police apparently left behind at the grave. Hey! Police claim the bullet that killed Angel is different from the kind of riot control bullets their officers use. Police insist they used minimum force to disperse the protesters on March 3rd. It's unknown who fired the bullet that killed Angel, but an activist video shows a soldier firing what appears to be an assault rifle at the protesters. This was filmed moments after Angel's shooting on the same street where she was fatally wounded. The United Nations estimates scores of people have been killed in Myanmar in recent weeks. A top UN official lays the blame squarely on the security forces. And now we're seeing orders that police and military soldiers um, shoot people down in cold blood. Supporters have rebuilt Angel's desecrated grave. Friends are now calling her a martyr for democracy. Ivan Watson, CNN, Hong Kong.
The UN Special Rapporteur to Myanmar says the military junta is unleashing, quote, terror and lawlessness against civilians. He's saying again that there is mounting evidence that security forces are committing crimes against humanity, but that has not been enough so far to force the UN Security Council into action. Richard Roth explains what's holding them up. The people of Myanmar, currently under the gun in the streets of their own country, should not really be hoping for immediate outside intervention by the UN or any other force. That's because the global organization is just not functioning that way. There's just too much division inside the 15-member UN Security Council, especially the big powers. In order for Western countries to get the first formal condemnation of the coup on the books, Russia and China insisted that the wording of the statement not include the word coup, and it shouldn't include any threat of further measures should the Myanmar generals fail to comply. So in order to get that compromise that many countries wanted, they had to give in on that very significant wording. So whether the Myanmar generals really get any kind of hint to do something to protect their own people is highly unlikely. And the UN is just set up in a different kind of labyrinth. You will hear headlines that the UN a high human rights representative in Geneva denouncing Myanmar for potential crimes against humanity and that something, a message has to be sent to the general so they know there's no impunity. Uh, the problem is that that's not the full UN. It's really the Security Council that causes action, legal action, uh, under the charter of the UN. So you can't be fooled when you see headlines about UN condemns Myanmar generals. It doesn't necessarily mean it will lead to action. Richard Roth, CNN, New York. And Kaylee Long joins me now. She's a Myanmar researcher for Amnesty International. And, and thanks for doing this. Uh, you're in London right now, but uh, you, you've worked in Myanmar, been on the ground. How, how would you assess the determination of the people to resist military rule? As we've seen, the, the response to the situation there has been enormous. But it is important to remember that people are just exercising their rights. They are allowed under international law to express themselves freely to have freedom of assembly and freedom of association. And those rights are being trampled all over by the military. N knowing the people are, as you do, are, are you in some way surprised that the protests have gone on this long despite the military violence or, or not surprised? I think there's a real determination from protesters, but what has been shocking is the brutality of the response from the military. Talk about the role of the military chief, the general, Min Ong Klang, and, 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 and why he sees power, because this is very much about him and, and his ambitions and, and position, and, and according to many observers, his personal financial interests as well. What to make of him and his role? The new general, Min Ong Klang, has um, had command responsibility for a number of atrocities in recent years. Um, obviously, there was the Rohingya crisis of 2016 and 17, but this is a military with a long history of impunity, particularly in the ethnic states. And the difference is that this time around, we're seeing it meted out in the cities and towns all around the country on camera. Uh, how, how strong, uh, as you've seen this unfold, how strong is the evidence against the military in terms of, of, of its use of force and tactics? I mean, one imagines that the smartphone images uh, that have been documenting the crackdown uh, it could result in, I don't know, increased pressure, but also uh, possible evidence for what might be to come in terms of international action once this is over. As you say, there has been a pretty constant stream of information coming out, um, really shocking images and footage um, each day while the internet is on. Um, as you know, they've been shutting it down each night. So it's really, really shocking uh, to see this conduct caught on camera. Um, as for whether that will serve as evidence in, in future criminal proceedings, I'm not sure. But certainly at Amnesty, we've been analysing that to try and uh, piece together who's been responsible for the killings and the violence that we've seen on the streets. You, you mentioned the Rohingya, and it's worth talking about that because it shows that the, the military has form, if you like. I mean, uh, the, the killings, the displacements, the horrors of what happened to the Rohingya. Th there was international outrage, but so far, few, if any, meaningful consequences for the military over what happened to the Rohingya. Do, do you think that, in some ways, that inaction has, has emboldened the military, that they think this time there won't be meaningful consequences either? 
Absolutely. I think the the fact that we're in this situation today is the direct result of a failure to hold them to account for their past crimes in ethnic areas against the Rohingya as well as other ethnic minorities. So this is why we're really calling for decisive action. This this just it's history repeating and it can't happen like this again. Yeah. So so what what is it you want to see done? I mean, what what is going to be effective? The the UN Security Council has often shown itself to be a toothless tiger when it comes to the self-interest of the permanent members. So I, I don't I don't know that anyone's going to hold their breath for something substantial on that. But what what would you like to see done? An arms embargo? What? Yeah, as you say, there's a problem with this stalemate in the Security Council. But what we would like to see pushed through. And what should happen is a comprehensive global arms embargo, as well as a referral of the situation in Myanmar as a whole to the International Criminal Court. And in order for that to happen, Myanmar's allies who shielded them from responsibility time and time again really need to, to get out of the way on this. Yeah, yeah, and, and and just quickly, I mean, the country has operated under sanctions before, and 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 survived. I mean, uh, what, what else do you think can be done in terms of pressuring from the outside, in terms of the public? What what can can people? Because I get I get messages all the time, people saying, "What can we do?" I mean, is is there anything? Can they, you know, help with amnesty or or what? What would you tell people? I think there's. Uh a lot of organizations that are working to try and raise awareness about the situation in Myanmar. But I think um, it's critical that people maintain pressure on their governments and their elected representatives, um, whether they're able to exercise leverage as a state in their direct unilateral relationship with Myanmar, or by applying pressure to allies of Myanmar who might have more influence in this situation to call for a de-escalation of violence and for the military to re like refrain from the use of force in order to try and order stop, to try and stop from this from getting any worse than it already is. Yeah. Kaylee, along with Amnesty International, really appreciate you coming on a very important issue happening. Thank you.